Welcome to this teaching on the supernatural power of water baptism. My name is Greg Carietta. In the next few minutes, I'm going to walk you through the scriptures that show you what water baptism really is. Not just what it is, but its function. How it's going to transform your life and, and why, why you need to be baptized in water and what it does for you. It's important. In fact, in the Bible, Water baptism was so important in the book of Acts that they would baptize people as soon as possible. Like, uh, for instance, in Acts chapter 8, uh, Philip was sent by an angel onto a certain road in Gaza, and, and uh, he, inter- he intercepted with an Ethiopian eunuch who was the uh, treasurer of Queen Candace's treasury in Ethiopia. And he was reading the book of Isaiah, and, and Philip heard him reading and said, do you understand what you're talking about? And the guy said, how can I understand unless somebody explains it to me? And so Philip joined him and taught him about being saved in Jesus' name. And the guy stops the chariot and says, look, there's some water. I want to be baptized. So even in the ditch, you know, he said, there's some water. I'm going to be baptized. Uh, In the book of Acts uh, chapter 9, Paul the apostle, as soon as he was uh, like he was knocked off his horse by Jesus in, a, in an encounter with the Lord, and he was blind for three days. God sent one of the disciples in that city to where Paul was to lay hands on him and receive his sight. And as soon as he was able to see, he went and he got baptized as soon as possible. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, he was a Roman centurion. He sent, he's having a, a time of prayer. At three o'clock in the afternoon, and an angel appeared. And this angel tells him to go to a certain city and bring Peter to where he is so Peter can teach him all about Jesus. And Peter goes to Cornelius' house. Cornelius gathers all of his friends and family, and they get them in the house, and Peter's sharing the gospel with them. And he gets to a certain point about the ones that believe in Jesus will be saved, and the Holy Spirit falls upon all the people that are listening to Peter, and they start speaking with other tongues. And then Peter says, who can forbid water baptism for these that have received the Holy Spirit just like we did at the beginning? So they baptize them right away. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Barnabas are preaching in Philippi. My name is Paul and Silas. They're preaching in Philippi, and by the river, and they're doing a prayer meeting, and this lady named Lydia, a businesswoman in the community, she hears the word of the Lord, and she gets saved. And as soon as she's saved, her and all of her family are baptized in the river. They baptize them as soon as possible. In that same area, Paul and Silas get arrested, thrown into prison, and in the middle of the night, they are praising God and thanking God, and God sends an earthquake and breaks all the 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 fetters of everybody that's in the prison and opens up all the doors and the jailer thinks oh no everybody's escaped and he's about to kill himself and paul says don't harm yourself we're all here we're all still here and this jailer comes before paul and falls down before him and says what do i need to do to be saved and paul said believe on the lord jesus christ and you shall be saved you and your whole household the jailer brought paul and silas to his house cleaned up their wounds And then the uh, jailer and his entire household in the middle of the night went to the river and they were baptized in water. So this was an urgency that was in place in the early church that as soon as a person believed they should be baptized and they had an understanding of what water baptism is all about. So in scripture, in Matthew chapter 28 and in verse uh, 18, Jesus came and spoke to the disciples saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This was part of the command of Jesus. Go make disciples, baptize them in the name of of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that means that you are coming under the government of God. You are uniting your life with God. It's like a covenant that you're making with Him. 
And it's like a New Testament covenant. And in the Old Testament, the covenant sign was a sign of circumcision. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's connected to water baptism. And the sign of the circumcision was the sign that you had a covenant with God. Now, you could be a man in a, a household that had a covenant with God, but until you yourself were circumcised, you were just part of a covenant family. You yourself were not a covenant person. And that's the same with water baptism. You're part of the covenant family when you are in Jesus and you put your trust in him and you're born of the spirit of God, you're saved. And if you were to die, you would go to heaven, but you are a covenant child of God when you go through the water baptism. That's when you yourself have said, I am stepping forward. I am making my commitment to God and I'm being water baptized. Everything else from my past is being washed away. I'm choosing a new day, a new life, and a new beginning for myself. And when you do that, there is a sign in the spirit that says you yourself are a covenant person with God. Everything that the Father has becomes available to you. That's what the Holy Spirit shows you. He takes everything that's of God and reveals it to you. And everything that God has, Jesus has access to. And the Holy Spirit is going to reveal all of that to you. This happens at the water baptism. This is what opens a door for this to occur at the water baptism because you yourself become a covenant child with God in the water baptism. You are declaring in the spirit to the angels of God, to God himself, to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus, to every demon spirit that wants to pay attention. You are declaring to all people in this world that you are someone who is following in God and you are a covenant person with God when you get baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's another scripture that says something similar to this at a similar time in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. And this starts in verse 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. So here Jesus is telling him, go into the world, preach the gospel to everybody. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Now that word saved is a Greek word called sozo. It means having your life completely set free, put back together again. I mean, delivered, healed, blessed, uh, prosperous. It's a wholeness that comes into your life. The one who is bab- believes and is baptized shall be saved. And it's really a deliverance of your flesh from the things of this world. It's a freedom that is available to you that comes through the water baptism. And we're going to look at that in a bit. So what does the word baptize mean? Well, in the Bible, there's two words used in baptism. Well, for baptize, there's two Greek words. One is the word bapto. And the second word is the word baptizo. Both of these words were used in a pickle recipe by an, a poet named Nicander in 200 BC. And in this pickle recipe, he used both words, and it helps us to understand the application and the meaning of them. So in the recipe, he said, you would take the cucumber and you would bapto it into boiling water. And then you would take that baptoed cucumber and baptizo that cucumber in the vinegar solution. And the nature of the cucumber then would be changed. Similar thing happens with us, is that when we are baptizo in water, we are changed by the power of the name of Jesus. And we are changed by the power of the Spirit of God and the power of the water baptism. So 
to immerse, like to dip is bapto. Baptizo is the word to immerse into. And that is the word used when it's talking about baptism. It's an immersion. Now, you may have been baptized as a child. Really, I call that a dedication of your life to the Lord. But as a, as a child, you could not, of your own volition, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You yourself had not believed. Your parents were acting in your stead. And uh, it isn't until you yourself receive Jesus that baptism is critically important. And so if you were even baptized as a child, as an adult now, you need to make the choice to be baptized yourself and immersed fully into water because of what it is and its function and how it works. Now, there's one more scripture along this line where we're instructed about baptism, and it's in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter, um, the apostle, has been teaching on the day of Pentecost. Um, the Holy Spirit came at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, and he filled the house where they were sitting, and a fire appeared, and tongues of fire went into each of the people, and they were filled with the Spirit, began to speak with other tongues, and they were speaking in tongues, and all the people that were there at the temple, they could hear in their own languages the wonders and the glory of God coming from people who didn't know their language. So they were they were amazed at what happened, and so this crowd had gathered. It was a sign to the unbeliever, just like in Mark it said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will speak with new tongues. This was the sign that gathered all these people, and, and so they're, they're, they're wondering what's going on. And Peter sees the crowd and he starts to preach the gospel. And so as he's preaching, he gets to a point where he said, Therefore, let the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37. Now, when they heard this, all these people that were gathered, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself." And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. You see, they counted disciples after they were baptized. Because baptism was a statement, a total statement that says, Anything that I believe before this is now moot. Now I believe in Jesus and I'm walking with God. So people that were involved in idolatry, they were saying, I am no longer following idols. I am now following Jesus. Those that were following legalism in Judaism, they were saying, I'm no longer following legalism in Judaism. I am now following Jesus. I am now following Jesus. Now, the fulfillment of all the law and the fulfillment of everything that's written in the Torah is found in Christ Jesus because Jesus is Jewish. Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah, and he is all of his teaching comes from that perspective, from a Hebrew cultural perspective. And we owe everything to, uh, to God for bring, bringing his covenants and everything through the Jewish nation. I'm so grateful to God for that. We are grafted into them. And, and it's a blessing to have access to the word of God because they were faithful to preserve and protect the word of the Lord like they did. And so they're saying that the baptism was this major statement and it would cause persecution. And it still does to this day among many different religious groups that if you get baptized in the name of Jesus, you're in trouble with your family. They'll disinherit you, disassociate you, excommunicate you. A lot of things can happen. Now, you can go to that family and you can say, hey, you know what? I believe in Jesus. They'll say, fantastic. Your life looks better. Great for you. Oh, by the way, I'm getting baptized in the name of Jesus. Oh, you can't do that because of the seriousness of it. It's a cutting away of the past. 
and I'm moving forward into the future. Now, if you've lived a wicked life, if you've lived in sin, if you've lived, that's a good news thing, right? All of that stuff is getting washed away from you. And that's the power of the water baptism. So now we're going to look at Jesus getting baptized. And there are, there are secrets and clues in what happened for him. They can happen for you. And the baptism of Jesus that we're going to look at is in, in Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. So it's his cousin John, the Baptist, that's baptizing all the people. So this is something they did even before Jesus came along. It, baptism is, is from the Hebrew culture, by the way. And there's four things that within the Hebrew culture that they believed that water baptism did. And this is the function of it. Here's the four things. One, prepares a person for closer communion with God. Number two, enables believers to receive the Holy Spirit and to stand in the Shekinah and presence of God. The Shekinah glory and the presence of God. Number three, cleanses the person from idolatry and restores purity in their heart, in their life, like a newborn child. This is from a Hebrew, Hebrew dictionary and encyclopedia, by the way. This is, what it, this is how they view water baptism. And number four, in the name of God, a person must be baptized to come under the government of the kingdom of God. So this is the perspective that John the Baptism was baptizing people from, was from this Hebrew perspective to prepare the nation for closer communion with God, for enabling of the Holy Spirit uh, to be filling them and for people to stand in the Shekinah and presence of God, to cleanse them from idolatry and restore purity like a newborn child and in the name of God to come under the kingdom of God's government and authority. So that's the the benchmark for us is that we come into baptism from this perspective. This isn't a Western world thing. This is a Hebrew thing. And so we need to honor it with definite faith. So in verse 21, now all the people were baptized. Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Wow. So there's a number of things happening here. Number one, Jesus gets baptized. And then now he is praying after being baptized. And while he is praying, heaven was open. So in your baptism, you can expect that as you pray after you're baptized, heaven will be opened over your life. Heaven will be opened and prayer will be easy because heaven is open. So as he was praying, heaven was open. Number two thing happened. The Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. Means that the Holy Spirit will fill your life in a fresh way. You may get baptized in the Holy Spirit at the same time because there's one baptism in Jesus. This baptism has two parts. It has the baptism in water and the Spirit. Paul the Apostle was teaching the Corinthians about uh, Moses and the children of Israel. He said the children of Israel were baptized into Moses in the water and in the cloud, in the cloud and in the sea. So they were. it was one baptism into Moses with two parts, the water and the cloud. And for us, it's the same thing. We get baptized into Jesus in the water and in the cloud, the Holy Spirit. So we get baptized in the water. We get baptized in the, in the Spirit. It's one baptism with two elements. And that's the baptism. So the Holy Spirit come, will come upon you. So number one, heaven opens. Number two, the Spirit of God will come upon your life in a fresh way. Number three, a voice came out of heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. This is the good news. God will speak to you. The Father will speak to you and he will affirm to you who you are to him, what you mean to him, how you matter to him. He'll express to you how proud he is of you, how loved you are. 
This is what happens. Heaven is open. Spirit of God comes down upon you. A voice comes out of heaven. You are my beloved son, my beloved daughter. In you, I am well pleased. This is why baptism is so important. It gets you connected with your origin identity. Your identity coming from the approval of God. Let him affirm who you are and what you are from his perspective to you and believe him. Believe him when he tells you that he loves you. Believe him when he tells you that he's proud of you. Believe him when he tells you that he approves of you and accepts you as you are. Believe him and it'll transform your life. Praise God. So this is, this is a, what to expect for yourself when you're baptized. Heaven open as you pray, Holy Spirit coming upon you, and the Father speaking to you. So I, I tell you what, I used to not believe all the same stuff that I'm teaching you here. When I first was learning about baptism, I was a youth pastor in a church, and I was given the notes uh, from somebody who had put them together about baptism that he got from Bible college. And it was the standard stuff that it's an outward sign of an inward change that you're in the you're following Jesus in obedience and all these different things. But there was no power. There was no evidence of the power of God. There was no revelation. People's lives weren't being transformed by the baptism. And I was bothered by that because I believe that if there's if it's of a revelation, there should be power attached to it. So I began to pray and seek God and said, Lord, where's the power? Where is the power in the baptism? I'm not understanding this properly. And that went on for about six months. And then I was at this conference and I heard a preacher named Rick Godwin talk, just made some comments about how uh, the Israelites were baptized into Moses in the water and in the cloud and, and how they baptized people in the middle of the night in the ditch and all that stuff I've already told you about. And as soon as he said that, the Holy Spirit opened up a pathway of revelation for me and he began to take me through the scriptures in a way I never saw before. And I'm going to walk you through what he showed me. So the first place he took me to was the Red Sea. This is a picture of baptism for us in the New Testament. What happened at the Red Sea in the children of Israel? Now you need to read your Bible. This is back in the book of Exodus. This is Moses. If, you, if you've ever watched a movie, the Ten Commandments, this is the story of the Ten Commandments, of them being slaves in Egypt and God sending a deliverer named Moses to bring them out of Egypt. And so Moses has got them to the edge of the Red Sea and he's crying out to God. And God says, stretch out your rod over the water and part the water. So Moses does that. He parts the water because when they left Egypt, they took everything with them. They went and they asked their neighbors for silver, gold, for clothing, for fabrics, for anything. And the Egyptians gladly gave the Israelites everything that they asked for. They held nothing back. They were so glad to see these people leave their nation. And the Israelites plundered the nation and it was done willingly by the uh, Egyptians at the time. And so the children of Israel taking all of this out and they were the main labor force, slave labor force within the nation of Egypt at the time. And after this happened, Pharaoh's like, what's going on? We're going to lose our labor force. They're taking all of our money. We've got to stop this. And so he gets his army together and he's chasing them through uh, the Sinai Peninsula to the other side of the peninsula at the Bay of Aqaba. And, and that's where Moses and the children of Israel are. They're on the eastern shore of the, of the Sinai Peninsula on the Bay of Aqaba. And they're looking towards Saudi Arabia. And, and the, and the uh, Egyptian army is coming up behind them in the, in the wilderness of Sinai. And God is placing a pillar of fire behind the nation of Israel. And then Moses stretches his hands out. And God parts the water at this place. And they go through the water on dry ground. And there's a wall of water on one side and the other. And they're going through the Red Sea. Not the Red Sea, but the Bay of Aqaba. Which is really part of the Red Sea. But this is where they're going. <laughs> and they're going through this Bay of Aqaba across over to Saudi Arabia, because that's where Jebel al Alz is, the mountain of God. Um, it's not where Mount Sinai is on Sinai Peninsula. It's over in Saudi Arabia. 
and there's archaeological evidence that it's there. So they're crossing in this Bay of Aqaba, and when Pharaoh and his army tried to do the same thing, the water came over them and destroyed them. So this is a picture of what happens for us. Pharaoh and his army is like the devil and his demons. And the water of the Red Sea is like water baptism for you and I. And that when we go through the water and the devil tries to attack us after we're through the water, he can't. He gets destroyed at the water. And that's why it's a deliverance for you. The evil spirits, the familiar spirits, the demonic influences, the idolatry, the demonic contacts that you've had in, in, in place throughout your life, those are all confronted at the water and that they can be broken at the water if you believe that it can happen then. So this is, this is what the Holy Spirit showed me is that the devil can't cross the water. He can't get through it. And when he sees the sign of the water baptism on you in the spirit, he's going to test to see whether or not you know what's going on. And if you know what's going on, that this is your covenant with Jesus yourself and that you have his name, the covenant name, and you're under the government of the kingdom of God, you're powerful. And if you know you're powerful, he's, he's going to try to test that. And you realize that yourself, He's not going to he's not going to want to get beat up all the time, I'll tell you that. The next scripture the Holy Spirit took me to was in Colossians. And in the book of Colossians chapter 2, Jesus used a word called circumcision. And this was what the Holy Spirit showed me, he said it's like circumcision in this particular passage. And I'm like, circumcision in water? Baptism? How how is that possible? And so here starting in Verse 9 of chapter 2. I'm going to read a little ways here. It says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. This is the justice of God at the cross, and all of the charges that were against you were dropped because of what Jesus did. In this passage, it talks about circumcision made without hands, the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ being done at the water baptism. Jesus is there at the water baptism to bring about a circumcision of your life, of your heart, and it happens in the water. I'm going to read from the complete Jewish Bible in this passage. Also, it was in union with him that you were circumcised, with a circumcision not done by human hands, but accomplished by stripping away the old nature's control over the body. In this circumcision done by the Messiah, you were buried along with him by being immersed, and in union with him, you were also raised up along with God by God's faithfulness that worked when he raised Yeshua from the dead. This is the complete Jewish Bible. Tells it like it is. This is a circumcision done by the Messiah when you were buried with him by being baptized. This is what happens, a circumcision. So when I'm looking at this scripture, I'm saying circumcision, the Holy Spirit says, go to Joshua chapter 5. So in Joshua chapter 5, this is when Joshua is bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. All of the people 
that did not believe God when he first brought them to the promised land, they had to die off in the wilderness. And now their kids were now at the promised land, but the kids had never been circumcised. The one their parents had been, but they had not been. And so God is telling Joshua, today I want you to circumcise all of the nation. And so they were, and it was called uh, Gilgal. It was the place where they did this. And in verse 8, it says this, When all the nation had been circumcised, every one of them, they stayed where they were in camp until they had healed. Adonai said to Joshua, Today I have rolled off from you the stigma of Egypt. This is why the place has been called Gilgal, which means rolling ever since. So this is what happened in the circumcision in Joshua's day. And this is what Jesus performs in Colossians, that he is going to be with you in your water baptism for the removal of the flesh off of your body, the nature of sin off of your body, that your sins would be washed away at the water baptism. Your sins, your past, completely washed away at the water baptism. And Jesus is there to perform the circumcision of your heart. So it means that this body of sin, this sin nature, gets pulled off of you so that you, as a spirit being, in in your soul and your body, are free to serve God. You're liberated from the control of that body of sin that's around you. And that's what this circumcision that Jesus, the reproach of the world, the reproach of sin, the reproach of transgressions, of iniquities, the reproach of all your broken promises and bad decisions, all of that gets washed away at the water baptism. Do you see how important and how valuable the water baptism really is? This is the function so that you are delivered from sin. You're delivered from the devil. You're delivered from this world. You're brought into the kingdom of heaven. You are a covenant child. The spirit of God comes upon you. God speaks to you. When heaven is open over your life. That's what happens with the water baptism. Praise the Lord. This is exciting. Hallelujah. Now we're going to look at Romans chapter 6. Because in Romans 6, it talks about how we are united with him into his death and united with him into his resurrection by the water baptism. Romans 6, verse 1. So then, are we to say, let's keep on sinning so that there can be more grace? Heaven forbid. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Don't you know that those of us who have been baptized into the Messiah, Yeshua, have been baptized into his death? Wait a minute. He's talking to them as if they were were supposed to know this already. Don't you know that those of us who have been baptized into the Messiah, Yeshua, have been baptized into his death? Through baptism into his death, we were buried with him so that just as through the glory of the Father, the Messiah was raised from the dead, likewise, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, We also will be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was put to death on the cross with him so that the entire body of our sinful propensities might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For someone who has died has been cleared from sin. Now, since we died with the Messiah, we must trust we will also live with him. We know that the Messiah has been raised from the dead, never to die again. Death has no authority over him. For his death was a unique event and need not be repeated, but his life, he keeps on living for God. In the same way, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive for God by your union with the Messiah, Yeshua. So he's saying when you are baptized, you're baptized into his death. It's like you are being buried into death and then raised from the dead into a new life. You can now live a new life because your old self that had sinful propensities is stripped away from your 
body and from your spirit and from your soul. It's stripped away by the water baptism so that you can live in the freedom and the newness of the new covenant. This is where it comes from. It comes from the Hebrew perspective. This is what they believe, that you can now walk in the Shekinah of God. You can now walk with the purity of a newborn child. You can now walk in the authority of the kingdom of God because you're in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You're baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. This is so powerful. So you're baptized into his death, raised to eternal life in him and with him. Praise the Lord. This is what baptism does. This is the value of baptism. This is why baptism in water is so, so important and why you need to be baptized as soon as possible. So if you're by a swimming pool, by an ocean, a lake, a river, even a bathtub, find somebody, a friend, a family member, a pastor, uh, so, uh, your, your spiritual mentor, whoever you respect and want to be a part of it with you, celebrate it. Be baptized in water. Do it with this understanding. Do it with everything I've just taught you. This is the function of water baptism. This is why they baptize people in the middle of the night. This is why they baptize them in the ditch by the side of the road. This is why they baptize them as soon as they possibly could. It's because of how valuable and how important it really is. When you look at what happened with Jesus, heaven opened. The Spirit of God came upon him. God spoke to him. Same thing can happen with you. Baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everything the Father has is now available to you. Everything you have is available to God. At any moment you call on the name of the Lord, he rescues you, protects you, frees you, guides you, brings you what you need. Anything. God is with you. God is in you. God is around you. He gives his angels charge over you. They protect you and encamp around you. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. That is who you are. And when you're baptized in water, you yourself are making your covenant of circumcision with God. Jesus himself is there to roll the reproach of Egypt off of you. You are buried together with Jesus, raised up to a new life with him. Supernatural things can happen through your life now. This is the one element of baptism. The other element is that of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus is the one that baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. He is the one. You just ask him after you're baptized in the water, even before you're baptized in water. And some people ask, can I be baptized in the Holy Spirit before I'm baptized in water? The answer is yes. I was. I was filled with the Holy Spirit in September. Well, I got saved in August, filled with the Spirit in September, water baptized in in November. But it was after I was baptized in November that I got hungry for God, that I could finally understand the Scriptures, that I could hear the voice of God, that when I prayed, I felt the anointing and the power of God. The mystery of scripture was unlocked to me after I was baptized. Something came off of my life when I was water baptized and the Holy Spirit came into my life in greater power. I've got to tell you that after the Holy Spirit shared this revelation with me and I began to teach it in our water baptism classes, we started to see the power of God. The very first night that I shared it, We were baptizing about 20 or 25 people. And we would go to a swimming pool after the evening Sunday service. So we did the class at about 4 o'clock and uh, taught for about 40 minutes. And then then the church service was uh, on at 6 o'clock. And then um, after the 6 o'clock service, we'd go to the swimming pool and we'd baptize people. And myself and the associate pastor were um, the ones there baptizing And so on this particular night, uh, we're down in the water and I'm feeling this fire on my head. It was like this fire. And I'm looking up at the ceiling and think, where's this heat coming from? And I look behind me, there's nothing there. It it felt like a, I don't know, a a brooder lamp or a heat lamp right above my head. And I looked at the pastor, uh, Neil, and I said, Neil, do you feel that? And he goes, no, I don't 
feel anything. What are you feeling? So I feel this fire on my head. And I don't know what it's from. And he goes, wow, that's awesome, but don't, don't know what it is. And so first person comes to be baptized. And we pray for them. And we baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. And we put them under the water. And I felt this power hit him. And he falls under the power in the water. And we have to float him over to the edge of the pool and have someone there to hold him up. The next person, the same thing happened. The power of God hits him. He's slain in the spirit, in the water, person after person, slain in the spirit. In that uh, water baptism, there's a First Nations girl named Audrey getting baptized. And we baptized her. She got slain in the spirit. And we looked up and the next group of people that had gotten into the water were all of her family members that had come to watch her get baptized. And they came into the water in their street clothes. They weren't ready. They had no preparation. But they just came in because they were so moved by the spirit of God. Well, three of those four family members gave their life to Jesus. The other one was already saved. But three of them gave their heart to Jesus right in the water, and then we baptized them in the name of Jesus and in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was awesome. Miracles have happened. People uh, stopped smoking after water baptism. One guy that we baptized, he was uh, in a restaurant after, and this is when you could still smoke in restaurants, and He's about to light up a cigarette and he feels this tap on his shoulder. He looks behind him. There's nobody there. And he hears a voice says, you know what? You don't need that anymore. And he stopped smoking that very day. Hallelujah. We had deliverances happen in the water. Myself and another associate pastor one time were baptizing. And this lady goes under the water and comes up out of the water and she screams. She's like, ah! <laughs> and she looks at us goes what was that we said well you're free now praise god <laughs> and it was it was amazing we just had so much fun baptizing people because they had the revelation of what baptism really is so i want to encourage you get baptized as soon as possible find somebody to baptize you believe god for this to transform your life god bless you hey if you need help, we've got a prayer line. You can or prayer email. It's pray at courtsofheaven.ca. We can get you hooked up with churches around the world, different places that we have relationships. If you want to be a part of a church, we can provide resources to you. We have uh, an online course on justice in the courts of heaven. We've got different things and resources available to you. If you're just getting saved, if you're newly saved, like within the last couple of months, send us a note, pray at courtsofheaven.ca, and we will send you some resources free of charge and bless you and help you on your way in your walk with Jesus and get you hooked up into a community, an online community of other folks that are new believers as well. So we want to help you in these ways. God bless you. Thank you for listening to this. I'm Greg Curiata. We'll see you again another time. Bye-bye.